Hello everyone, welcome to the Friday Night Live. Um, I'll crack straight on. Um, and no, I won't actually at all. I wasn't going to do that at all. What I was going to do was, so there's a couple of questions here this week who kind of, they sort of tie into one topic. So I thought what I would do is um, talk right broadly around these two topics and then go on with the questions. Um, and the two topics I wanted to talk about, they're kind of interrelated, but they're cravings and certainty. Um, so firstly, cravings. So cravings are a conscious thought process. A, a lot of people think that cravings are just something that happen to you and you can't do anything about them. They just, you know, drop out the sky and hit you and you are craving. Um, and then you either wait it out or just suffer it or give into it. Um, they are not, they're a conscious thought process. Okay, human thoughts tend to run a, like along a linear process. And what's, what happens with cravings is the thought of an alcoholic drink, and I'm talking about alcohol specifically, although cravings as a psychological process can be pretty much applied to anything. Um, so the thought of an alcoholic drink enters your mind um, and that on its own doesn't cause the craving. What happens next causes the craving because if at that point when the thought of a drink enters your mind, you start to fantasize about it and anticipate it and obsess about it, that's what the craving is, okay? It is a thought process and it is a conscious thought process. Um, it's extremely distracting. Um, and if you are supposedly out and enjoying yourself or at home relaxing or you know, a nice meal or in front of the TV, whatever it might be, you won't be able to engage and enjoy what you're doing because your attention isn't on the enjoyable thing that you're doing. It's all taken up with this unpleasant internal tantrum stroke obsession stroke debate that you're having about whether to drink or not um that's why you can get into this situation where you know some people don't drink during the week but then find it very hard not to drink at the weekend it's a similar thing they might not be physically addicted to alcohol clearly they're not if they're going a few days without drinking but if on a friday night they go out and they just it's their drinking night so they can't think about anything but alcohol, they can't enjoy what they're doing, or even if it's just, you know, it's Friday night, it's a night at home like every other night, but Friday night is your drinking night, you might be all right Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, just going in and having a meal and watching TV and relaxing and enjoying it. But when it's Friday and it's your drinking night, you start obsessing about alcohol, so you can't relax and enjoy what you're doing. So that's about craving. The second point is about certainty. Because when you are a hundred percent certain you are not going to drink, you are hugely less likely to crave. And the reason for that is, is because if you know you're not going to drink, when the thought of an alcoholic drink enters your head, you don't start obsessing about it or fantasizing about it or testing it out, how it would feel to have that drink in your mind. You just shut it out. You don't have, you, you know, you're not going to have a drink. So like it's Friday night and I'm not going to drink. I'm not wasting time thinking or agonizing about whether to drink or not. I'm thinking about alcohol all the time. Every, <laughs> every Friday night I spend an hour talking about it, but I spend zero time obsessing about it or considering whether to actually have a drink. So, that certainty is key because, as I say, if you are certain you are not going to drink again, when the thought of an alcoholic drink enters your mind, you don't dwell on it. You don't obsess about it. You just think I'm not having one and that's it. And then you move on to the next thing that you're doing, which is, you know, Friday night watching TV, relaxing, going out with friends, whatever it is. So that certainty is really, really important. Um, I mentioned that at the outset before moving on to the questions, as I say, because there's a couple of questions where that theme kind of runs through it. And I think it's useful to talk about that up front. Um, the first question was fading effect bias. I know this is a hot topic, but I'm currently on day 21 after achieving 110 days previously and need to get on top of this. Hearing you mention this, albeit br briefly, I know you're so busy, William, will really help. So fading effects bias is a universal human trait whereby we look back on past events more positively than when they happened. So when I say universal, it applies to everyone, regardless of their 
cultural or ethnic background okay it runs through the whole of humanity um it's clearly there there's lots of theories about why it exists but the prevailing one is just it helps you maintain a more positive outlook on life because you think back and think you know more positively about things that have happened in your life where it becomes a problem is of course with addiction because you're drinking you don't like it the reality is you're tired all the time you're lethargic you're anxious it's just not a pleasant place to be um, but when you stop drinking you forget all of that and you start as I say talking about cravings again as well you start fantasizing about it you think about those one or two drinks that you had that you really believe you enjoyed you cut out all the rubbish and concentrate on the good and, and it's a natural process that we go through. It's basically nostalgia. It's looking back at the past more positively than when it actually happened. Um, so that's what it is. The, 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 there's a few ways to combat it. I mean, just, just knowing that it exists can be hugely powerful because, you know, you've stopped drinking, you've quit, you've gone 21 days, you're starting to feel better, your sleep's getting better, everything's looking good. And suddenly you start thinking how nice it would be to have a drink. And that can be massively demoralizing. Understanding that it's fading effect bias can be incredibly empowering because you know it's just that distorted view. Um, so don't let it derail you too much. And, and, and there's an obvious answer to it, and that is to stick with the reality. You know, what we're talking about here is a sedative. It makes you feel slightly dulled, and that's it. In fact, it only ever has two benefits. One is to relieve the withdrawal caused by the previous drinks. Um, and the other is to remove that craving process. So, you know, you're out with friends, but you can't relax and enjoy yourself because you're obsessing about alcohol. OK, well, if you have the drink, that obsession no longer happens. That debate about whether to have one or not is gone because you're already drinking. Alcohol is a placebo at that point. Um, it's just stopping that internal debate going on. They're the only two times that it does anything for you. And what does it take? Well, because it's a sedative, your brain counters that sedation by becoming hypersensitive. So when the alcohol wears off, there's a corresponding feeling of anxiety. OK, that's what anxiety is, that colloquial term for that anxious feeling you get after you've been drinking. Um, it ruins your sleep. So even one or two drinks interrupts your natural sleeping pattern. That's why the large, the biggest reported symptom of a hangover is tiredness. Even, as I say, one or two drinks makes people tired the next day. Um, and that's just one or two drinks. Obviously, if you're drinking more and more and more, you get the fully fledged hangover and, and writing entire days off when you can't do anything. Of course, the other thing alcohol does to everybody it is increases their heart rate. And I've seen ridiculous memes saying, you know, like benefits of a glass of wine, it increases your heart rate. Increasing your heart rate by taking a chemical is incredibly bad for you. Um, fitness is actually a lot to do with blood composition. OK, so when you move your muscles, they need oxygen and the oxygen gets to them by blood cells, red blood cells in the blood. So when you exercise regularly, your heart has to speed up to get that oxygen supply moving. Um, and when you do it regularly, your, your body adapts. And one of the ways it adapts is the age of the red blood cells decreases because the younger blood cells can carry more oxygen. And there's a greater concentration of red blood cells in the blood. So every pump of the heart delivers more oxygen to the muscles. So your resting heart rate drops. If you speed your heart rate by use of a chemical without any associated physical activity, the reverse happens. There's too much oxygen going round, So the average age of the red blood cells increases. So they carry less oxygen um, and they become less concentrated in the blood. And then your resting heart rate goes up. Um, and that is why increasing your heart rate with the use of a drug is incredibly bad for you and why the biggest killer with alcohol is not what a lot of people think liver disease. It's actually cardiovascular. Um, look at that Shane Warne. He died today. What was he, 50, 51 or 52 or something? Died of a massive heart attack, drank and smoked a lot. Um, it's absolutely a killer. So these things are totally ridiculous. But of course, in the here and now, speeding your heart rate up makes you feel lethargic because the quicker your heart goes the more your body says to you stop sit down and rest so that's why drinkers are often extremely lethargic 
Um, and that's what you need to stick with as a reality. Um, and if you do that, I think you can probably counter fading effect bias fairly well. Um, the next question, how many days do you think is scratching the itch, alleviating the withdrawal? And when are you free from that? Thank you. So the, the actual physical withdrawal, that chemical imbalance, that over anxiety that kicks in when you stop drinking, um, it's usually gone in about three to five days at the outside. OK, so that's like the worst case scenario. There's a lot of knock on effects after that where you can become extremely tired and you have to catch up on sleep and all the rest of it. I won't talk about that now because it's a whole other topic. Um, so you're not quite 100 percent after those five days. It can take a bit more time after that. Um, but that actual anxious feeling that you get when you're drinking regularly that's alleviated by the next drink is usually gone in about three to five days where it becomes confusing for people is the craving process because you can also feel a bit anxious and tense and not very pleasant <laughs> if you're going through the craving process and of course the craving can last for as long as you let it because every, every time a, a thought of a drink enters your mind and you start obsessing and fantasizing and should I shouldn't I and going through that thought process um, you will be craving and you won't feel pleasant um, and that can happen forever it happens until you stop it happening um, so the physical withdrawal can be well and truly gone, but you can still be craving alcohol but when you sort of fall into that thought process. Um, on a, this next question, on a scale of one to 10, how bad is a relapse? Say you have 30 days sober, then drink for three days. Are you a complete failure, a mild failure, or a strong, vigilant fighter who will gain strength from the experience? Um, you're a failure. <laughs> That may sound very harsh, but if your goal is to stop drinking and you haven't stopped drinking, you failed. It, it's binary from what I, how I understand it's binary, it's, i.e. It's, it's one thing or the other. It's like flicking a light on. A light is either on or off. You, you can't say, can you put the light on, really, really put it on, unless it's a dimmer switch. You know, talking about normal switches here. A switch is either on or off um, in the same way if you're stopping drinking and you drink, you haven't stopped drinking, therefore you failed. Um, so I don't see it, whether it's a complete failure or a mild failure or whatever, it's just a failure. I think the real question here is the fact that humans do fail an awful lot and that's how we learn and achieve things. Um, so for example, if I learn to juggle, I don't expect to just start throwing balls perfectly. I expect to drop them over and over and over and over again until I learn the right muscle and hand-eye coordination to juggle successfully. So failure isn't necessarily a bad thing. So in answer to the question is, it's a failure, neither a huge failure nor a small failure, it's just a failure. But it's what you do with failure that is the key. Um, and do you learn from it and move on from it? Um, there's a couple of points to make here. Firstly, if you're going to learn from the failure, you have to do it in the right way. There's no point, I'm going to stop drinking and you sit there sweating and, you know, agonizing about whether to have a drink. And then you just think, I can't go on with this. I'm just going to have a drink. And then you just sit back and relax and have your drink and then feel awful the next day. You achieve nothing. You need to actually stop at that point and think, what is what am I hoping to achieve from this? Um, what am I trying to get from it? Am I trying to feel relaxed, happy, and then have the drink and see if it actually does it or not? That's what a learning experience is. And I think a lot of people, a relapse isn't a learning experience. It's kind of like an ongoing process whereby they sort of give in and drink and then try again. You know, there's there's quite a common dynamic of people who just endless day ones. They wake up, they feel awful, they want to quit, and then the evening comes and they have a drink and do it all again at infinitum. Um, but this is also why I want to talk. When I want to talk about, at the beginning about cravings and certainty and the need for that certainty, because it is one thing to have a relapse and to learn from it. And to then think, right, what am I going to do different next time? What happened this time? I got in from work. I felt I had a really bad day. I just really want, okay, so that's going to happen again. How am I going to react differently? What mindset am I going to have? What do I need to change in my thinking so that that doesn't happen again? And not many people actually do that with their relapses. Um, so you absolutely have to do that. Um, 
the certainty, and this is the other thing, and it's a very difficult path to tread and it's different for everyone, but okay, if you've stopped drinking for 30 days and then you've fallen off the wagon and drunk for three days and then you want to stop again, okay, it's done, okay, done and dusted. You cannot change it. All you can do is look forward and get on with the new stuff and hopefully learn from it and be stronger the next time. So on one hand, there's not a lot of point beating yourself up over it. However, what you can't do is excuse it and just say, you know what, I'm not going to let it worry me. It's fine. Because what you're doing then is excusing failure. And this is one of the problems people get stuck into this rut of endless day ones is because it just becomes the norm. They're so used to not achieving what they want to do. They excuse failure. So it's almost like, oh, well, this is just another day where I'm going to put it off until tomorrow. You have to make it, you have to make it count. You have to give it your best shot. Um, So on the one hand, yeah, there's not a lot to be gained in beating yourself up over it. But on the other hand, you do have to have regrets about drinking because otherwise you make it too easy to do it again the next time. So you can't start an attempt thinking it's okay if I fail, I'll chalk it up to experience because all you're really doing is giving yourself license to to drink um so you have to be quite careful of that it's different rules for different people i mean i've last month celebrated eight years without alcohol now technically it wasn't eight years because at one point i wasn't very well and i took some night nurse not realizing it's 20 percent alcohol so technically i can see i don't even remember then when that was but I don't count that as a failure and I count my sobriety date from 2014, whenever it was 2014. Um, And other people count in different ways. You know, people quite legitimately quit drinking. They completely change their mindset. They quit drinking, but then an event comes up and they have a drink and it solidifies their decision not to drink. And they don't count their sober date from that drink. They count it from when their mindset actually changed. Um, we make these things up as we go along. It's, it's individual to each person. But what I'm saying is you, you, you have to, you have to have certainty over quitting. You can't excuse yourself being able to just go back to it because you remove that certainty. The other point there is of course, is 30 days sober very much depends on, on what you did during those 30 days, because let me give you two very different scenarios, 30 days sober, where which is what a lot of people do in dry January, they don't do anything because they're not drinking. And if someone says to them, do you want to go out tonight? No, I'm not drinking. Therefore, I'm not going to go out. I'm not going to do anything. I won't go out for a meal. I won't go out with my friends. I'm just going to sit there and do nothing for a month while I go through this penance. If you've spent a month sober doing that, you've probably not learned an awful lot other than to reinforce what is a completely false thing anyway that you need alcohol to enjoy yourself however if you've spent 30 days going you know what I'm going to go out and try and enjoy myself without a drink and then go out and socialize and think you know what I did enjoy myself it wasn't as awful as I thought I can do this if you spent 30 days doing that and then you have a relapse of course it's not all wasted because you've got that 30 days experience and that 30 days experience have taught you that yes you absolutely can enjoy and live your life without a drink Whereas if you did it the first way, you've almost done more harm than good because you've just taught yourself that oh, that was an awful month. I didn't enjoy that at all because I wasn't drinking. Um, there have been a lot of posts recently with people saying, how do you stop drinking or I just can't do it, etc." What would you say to those people? So my first stop with people is always, have you read the book? And an awful lot of people haven't. Um, it seems to help people. OK, it doesn't help everyone. Nothing's going to help everyone. Um, But there are still a lot of people in the group who haven't read it. So I would urge you, please, to do that if you haven't done it and you are struggling. The first five chapters are on the website for free. Okay, so you don't even have to part with a single penny. You can go on there and read the first five chapters. 
if you find them useful and interesting, then the rest of the book will be useful and interesting because the rest of the book continues in the same vein. If you find it a load of old twaddle and you have no interest in it at all, then you will find the rest of the book exactly the same because it continues in the same vein, but at least give it a go. Um, if you're not a big reader, there is a course as well. There's 73 modules and don't be put off by the length because some of them are just literally a minute or two. Um, dealing with every single aspect of drinking, socialising, relaxing, everything. And the first seven of those modules are on the on the site for free as well. So again, give it a go and see how you do it. But again, it's very difficult because a lot of people haven't read it and they read it, and find it useful. Some people have found it useful, but still not managed to quit. If you're in that latter category, look elsewhere. Alcohol Explained is one of many, many different perspectives and methods people use to quit. Some people use it on its own very successfully. Some people use it as a medley with other things. Um, I have yet to read any quit lit book that I haven't got something out of. Um, so I, I would advise those people to just keep looking. Um, in terms of addictions, do you think they are interconnected? When I gave up drinking and everything seemed to be going fine, I decided to give up smoking as well. And suddenly there are cravings for one or both of the addictions. Would you say to keep more time in between giving up different addictions and sort the first one out before quitting the next? Or is it perfectly possible to quit them all together? It is perfectly possible to quit them together. And sometimes it's the best way of doing it, because when you go through the withdrawal stage which is a few days possibly weeks you don't feel particularly good um, and that's true for both of them so to my mind you might as well just go through them both at the same time and have done with it what you might have done here and I'm completely hazarding a guess is that so a lot of people use alcohol as a coping mechanism it's a sedative so if you have a bad day you take it and it anesthetizes your feelings slightly um, so it becomes, you know, of course, people drink to celebrate and all the rest of it, but it does for a lot of people become their go to coping mechanism. If you cigarettes do exactly the same as well, there's different dynamic involved, but they do exactly the same thing. So if you drink and smoke and cut out drinking, you've still got your cigarettes to smoke or equally, if you cut out smoking, you've still got your drinks to drink. Um, if you cut out both of them, you are effectively moving, removing both your go to coping mechanisms. So it can be more difficult doing it that way. Um, but you're essentially in the same situation as someone who has already quit. You know, you might quit smoking or drinking for months and then move on to the next one. You're still going to be in that position anyway. And it is as simple. I say simple, but it, what you need to do is develop new coping mechanisms. So expect to have bad days because we are human beings and we have bad days everybody does um, and what you need to do is prepare now what you will do when you have a bad day because your cigarettes and your alcohol won't be available so you know do you sit and read a book do you phone a friend do you do some exercise meditation yoga hobbies pastimes go for a walk whatever it might be but get those things sorted out now um the other thing, of course, is um, smoking causes a withdrawal. It's a tense, unpleasant feeling, and it's not at all dissimilar from alcohol. So you can sometimes kind of get mixed up between the two of them. So you might have given up alcohol and been OK with it. But when you've stopped smoking, it's caused that kind of tense, unpleasant feeling. And your brain is interpreting that is as I need <laughs> I need one or the other. Um, so they're my thoughts on that one. Uh, next question. It's one decision to stop drinking alcohol, right? You don't have to keep making the decision daily. That, again, is one of the questions that goes into the central theme of certainty. OK, so I decided eight and a bit years ago to never drink again. And that's job done. OK, um, I don't decide every possible time I could have a drink. Should I? Shouldn't I? Um, it's easier in some ways, once you've made that decision and got that certainty, everything becomes a lot simpler. Um, 
dawn of the fish followers society always says take alcohol off the menu and it's so true it's sometimes easier said than done but it, it just take it off the menu it's not there for you it's not an option because everything becomes a lot clearer then this is why i don't and i hasten to add here you don't have to take everything i say as gospel these are just my views and it's entirely up to you it's your prerogative to accept or reject them as you see fit but this is one of the reasons i'm not overly keen on one day at a time because you're kind of in taking it one day at a time you're denying that certainty and that certainty if done properly can be hugely empowering in allowing you to quit for the reasons or i've already discussed um but absolutely, I mean, if, if you're constantly every day having to think, should I, shouldn't I drink, I can only imagine it's utterly exhausting. Whereas if you can get to the mindset of I'm done with this, I'm just not, I'm done with it, I'm not doing it ever again, and I'm glad to see the back of it, it's a much more positive place to be. Um, a lot of people are pulled back, of course, by all their friends and relatives and colleagues who are drinking, and we kind of look at them and envy them. Um, but again, this is almost like the same thing as fading effect bias. They're taking a sedative that is killing them. OK, and I don't care what anyone says, even if it's just one or two, it's raising your chance. Al alcohol is a carcinogen. It's a class one carcinogen um, in the same. The World Health Organization puts carcinogens into different categories. Alcohol is a class one carcinogen, along with cigarette smoking and asbestos. Um, it increases your heart rate, which isn't a good thing. That kills you as well. It ruins your sleep. It causes feelings of anxiety um, and it makes you really lethargic. Um, and so when you look at other drinkers, that's what they're going through. Okay, I don't care who they are. Every time you see someone drinking, they will have a disturbed night's sleep. They'll be waking up at four in the morning, unable to get back to sleep and be dragging themselves through the next day, more tired than they would otherwise be. Even if it's just one glass of wine, they won't be firing on all cylinders in the same way they would be had they not drunk. Um, and the other thing is, well, what are they getting out of it? Well, they're getting a mild feeling of sedation before getting that feeling of anxiety. And, and the only reason they're going through that is because ever since they started, so, you know, when they hit teenage years or twenties or whatever and started drinking, they are then incapable of enjoying social occasions without alcohol. The fact that so many people in our country drink and are in that situation doesn't detract from the reality of it. Um, if I turn around and say, you know, a night with, you know, if you're going out with your friends, it's more fun if you're drinking, Every drinker, all 90% of the population who drink will go, yeah, that's true. A night out is more fun if you're drinking. But let me just rephrase that to mean exactly the same thing, but just slightly differently worded. These people can no longer enjoy themselves fully without a drug. OK, that means exactly the same thing as a night out is more fun when you're drinking. It's exactly the same as saying, I can't fully enjoy a night out without this drug. Um, they could enjoy a night out before they started drinking because kids enjoy social occasions. They go absolutely crazy and they do not need alcohol. It's only when we start drinking that we go through this. And again, it comes back to the craving thing, because if you're out with friends and you're thinking about alcohol and why you can't drink or should I have a drink or all the rest of it, you're not going to be relaxed and enjoying their company. So all the other drinkers out there are going through all these massive um, downsides to drinking and the benefits are just complete illusions. Um, would you discuss seizures during withdrawal? Um, I, it's an incredibly vague question and I'm not an expert on this at all. There are different types of seizures. Um, and I think people most use the term to describe any kind of problem people encounter when they stop drinking. Um, I had a quick look. So the repeated depression of the central nervous system causes it to spark into life with additional vigor when the drinker abstains. This rebounding effect of the nervous system produces alcohol withdrawal seizures. Alcohol seizures usually happen within three days of the individual stopping drinking, but they're most common around eight hours after stopping. Um, and that's basically it. I think if you're in, you know, I think we all say this, but if you're in any doubt about the amount you're drinking and then seizures or anything like that, then speak to a medical professional and get some proper advice about it. Um, 
I get the pure alcohol on its own doesn't taste good. What I don't get is why wine tastes sweet and insipid when the alcohol is removed. So alcohol must add something to the taste or is my brain just conditioned to enjoy poison, confused? Um, so I've never tasted alcohol free wine, so I don't know. But what I would say is, if it tastes sweet and insipid when alcohol is removed, then surely it's going to be tasting sweet and insipid and have a nasty, vile aftertaste on top of that with the, with the alcohol in it. Um, and yeah, I, alcohol on its own doesn't taste good. The other thing to bear in mind is this is, you know, I've I've broken alcohol down into what it does to us. So it creates that feeling of sedation followed by a feeling of anxiety. You know, when you're out with friends, you, you know, if you're thinking about alcohol, you can't really enjoy it without you don't seem able to enjoy social occasions quite so much without that drink anymore. Um, but of course, we don't experience it that way. People don't sit down and think right I'm going to have a glass of wine right here's the taste here's the feeling here's the this the this or this all kicking in we experience it all together and of course we're all busy people and we don't really do a lot of things mindfully and really concentrate on them so all we really know of it is when I drink this I feel better um, we never break it down and analyze it um, and a big part of it is the taste because it is a foul taste and it's quite an overpowering taste so when you drink it the taste is mixed up with all the rest of it so even though it tastes very strong and very foul we start to mix it up with the whole thing of yeah but it makes me feel good so there's that association in our brains so that when we drink alcohol we feel good so we start to then look forward to the taste the taste becomes a big part of it. it's the same way smokers believe they enjoy the taste of the, the taste of cigarettes it's the taste of burnt leaves um but they genuinely think yes i smoke for the taste but it's because it's all mixed up with the relieving of the withdrawal pangs and it's all mixed up together for them a lot not many people stop and analyze it um, so last question, is it possible that someone could actually be afraid to feel sober? All my life has been involved around alcohol to the point where I go a short time without drinking. I start to feel strange when I'm feeling better. Any ideas? Unless you're drinking all the time, which some people are, but mostly people just drink later in the day and in the evenings. In that case, you're sober much, much more than you're drunk anyway. Um so I don't think that's necessarily the case at all. Um, I'm hazarding a guess here again, but I'm start, I, I, to me, it would seem like because there, there's no comparison. You know, how would you rather feel anxious and exhausted and heavy and lethargic and depressed or light and positive and buoyant? Because the former is drinking and the latter is being sober. Um, so. I don't think anyone can be afraid to feel that way. And in fact, one of the main benefits of drinking is when you're a regular drinker, it makes you feel a bit like you'd never have a drink, had a drink to begin with, because it takes away the anxiety and the anesthetizes the anxiety and the exhaustion and that heavy feeling for a few minutes. So that for a couple of hours every day and imbibing this carcinogenic poison that exacerbates the symptoms drastically, you get for a few precious hours to feel a bit more like you'd never started drinking in the first place. Um, so no, I don't think that's the case at all. Um, I think it more likely that, as I say, it's a craving thing. So you start to feel normal, you start to feel better. And then the thought of an alcoholic drink enters your mind and you, you can't engage in anything else. Um, but again, as I say, I'm hazarding a guess there. Um, I hope that was useful for everyone. Have a lovely evening, everyone. And I shall um, see you next week. Goodbye.